I'll second. All right, well, thank you everybody for coming out for the next edition of our guest speaker series here at the Holland Land Office Museum. Uh, we're actually getting towards the end of our 2023 season, but I um, want to thank you all for coming out, even though the Bills are playing tonight, so I know right. that's where everybody else is, is they're getting ready for the Bills. <laughs> so, uh, so tonight we're very happy to have Amy Truesdell of when we booked this, she was from Maine. Uh, now she's moving to the Midwest, to Wisconsin. But uh, she uh, came across letters from uh, an ancestor who fought in the Civil War from New York, uh, from the Binghamton area, uh, Roland Truesdell. So she is going to talk to us today about uh, his experience in the war that she's been able to glean through his letters. And she published them through a book which I don't have any copies at the moment, but I will be getting some. So if you are interested, she did bring some to sell, but if anybody else wants some, I will be getting them. Just let me know, and I'll put my order in. But uh, Amy, you are free to take your order. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Ryan. And um, I'm just delighted to be here. We've talked about this evening for quite a while. And it feels great to finally be standing in front of you. And when I learned that it was on a night where the Bills were playing, <laughs> I just have to say thank you for coming. <laughs> so, from Binghamton to the battlefield, the Civil War letters of Rotland B. Truesdale. I'd like to approach this talk in reverse. That is, I'd like to walk you through each element of the title of the book before, and starting with the end, before concluding with what I think of as a delightful discovery that I made while doing the research for the book. I'll begin by answering the question, who was Rollin B. Truesdale? Next, I'll discuss the, the letters referred to in the title of the book. And finally, I'll share the arc of Rollin's experiences as an infantryman in the Union Army during the Civil War. I'll discuss the forces that transformed him from an eager recruit to a battle-weary veteran. Okay, let's talk about Rollin. As I think you probably know, the soldier in question was my great-great-grandfather. And growing up, my father took pleasure and pride in describing the towering man who was Rollin. Dad told stories about Rollin writing letters from the battlefields and the army camps during the war, and also of his successes as a businessman in his later years. As a young girl, I thought of Rollin as something of a celebrity in our family. And if I'm honest, I still do. <laughs> Rollin was a larger-than-life figure, not only due to his physical characteristics, he was a redhead and six foot one inches tall when the average man's height was about five foot seven. But also he was towering because of his ability to persevere, even as the world was crumbling under his feet. Rollin was gregarious, witty, educated, and determined. He made the life-changing decision at the age of 21 to leave the family farm and sign up to fight immediately after President Lincoln first rang the alarm bell asking for volunteers in the wake of the uh, rebel attack on Fort Sumter. As Rollin's sister Clara wrote in a letter to my great-grandfather years after the war, Rollin left home a boy and returned home a man, just as so many on both sides of the conflict had. Rollin was the youngest of six children, born into the tight-knit family of Lucy and Samuel Truesdell. They farmed in the rolling hills of Susquehanna County, Pennsylvania, in a town called Liberty, which is in the far northeast of the state, hugging the New York state border. Rollin's grandparents, Samuel and Lucretia Truesdell, were among the first settlers of Liberty. They migrated from Connecticut um, and in 1811 and laid claim to a vast tract of land in 1822. The deed for that land hangs on a, on a wall in my home today. Rowland grew up in the two-story brick farmhouse depicted on the slide, and the house still stands on that land today. In November of 2019, I made an early research trip to Elmira, Binghamton, and Albany in New York, 
and Susquehanna County in Pennsylvania. I was encouraged by my dad to track down the Truesdale homestead. And after some trial and a whole lot of errors, <laughs> I found it. The current owner uh, graciously invited me inside when she learned who I was. And I will say it was somewhat overwhelming to be standing in the same house that Roland wrote of lovingly to his family from the battlefields. I had such a wave of emotion, gratitude, a sense of homesickness, and sorrow that my dad wasn't standing next to me. The map that you see on the screen was drawn in 1856 and is titled Map of Free and Slaveholding States. The dark green shows free settled states, the light green the territories, dark pink state importers of enslaved people, the lighter pink state exporters of enslaved people. Rowland was raised in abolitionist territory and his parents were abolitionist sympathizers, if not outright abolitionists themselves. In fact, anti-slavery sentiment in Pennsylvania dates to 1688 when the Society of Friends first announced it. Susquehanna County was known to be a safe haven for runaway enslaved people from as early as 1792. In the same letter that I referred to earlier, in which Rollins' sister, Clara, responded to my great-grandfather's query about what memories stood out for her about the Civil War, she included the following passage. She wrote this letter in 1903, the year that she died. The first things, almost, I heard talked over in childhood were events which led up to the war. My father was a lifelong friend of the slave but never a violent abolitionist. My mother signed the first set of resolutions ever adopted at an abolition meeting in Susquehanna County, a marvelous thing for a woman to do at that time. Montrose, which is the county seat, was without doubt a station on the Underground Railroad, which helped so many slaves over the border. It was and is still a matter of pride that no fugitive slave was ever taken from Montrose. Some had narrow escapes, and I can myself remember seeing a well-known team passing our house on one Sunday by a shortcut from Montrose to Great Bend. Two women were the passengers. I heard my father say to himself, they will just make the emigrant train on the Erie Road, and tomorrow morning, those women will be in Canada. This impressed me very much. These would be strong bearings on Rollins' moral compass. Rollins fought in some of the bloodiest battles of the first two years of the Civil War and rose to the rank of sergeant. Spending time with Rollins through his letters, I began to feel his frustration, his consternation, as the behemoth Army of the Potomac repeatedly failed to deliver the decisive blow to the South that will end the bloodshed. <coughs> the letters. It feels quite remarkable in this day of texting and email and tick-tocking to have the handwritten letters that Roland mailed to his family over 160 years ago. Like many soldiers on both sides of the war, Roland was an avid letter writer. Today, the letters serve as a means to map the battles and the progress of the war. But more poignantly, they serve as a vehicle for tracing a young soldier's path as he survived each new challenge. Disease, numbing boredom in the army camps, homesickness, the terror and gore of combat, and the soul-wrenching anticipation of battle. On the cusp of manhood, they reveal notions of duty, honor, and patriotism. For the recruits, often away from their home communities for the first time, correspondence with loved ones reminded them of what they could return to, even as, uh, even as they withstood the unfathomable torments of war. Rollins' letters recount his experiences in the infantry while also reflecting the preoccupations of a young man. Rollin was a clear, largely unemotional reporter of what he saw in such bloody battlefields as Gaines Mill, Antietam, and Fredericksburg. 
but he also vividly described his day-to-day -day life as a soldier. Rollins' letters bragging about the improvised Thanksgiving feast he and his tentmate William Westervelt cooked in November of 1862 are a joy to read. Rollin wrote to his mother November 20th, 1862. My dear mother, Though we are seven days in advance of the time, we thought best to make sure of the supper today while we can and give thanks the 27th, a thing we can more easily do than cook a supper if we are on the march. Five o'clock. We have just ate our bountiful meal, which was very good. A number one. The goose we parboiled and baked in a kettle. We had the satisfaction of thinking it the best meal in camp, but best or second best, as the case might be, twas good. <laughs> Letters describing the infamous dreaded mud march of 1863 and others in which Rollins shares his sorrow about leaving wounded soldiers on the battlefield, knowing they would likely become prisoners or perish, leave an imprint on your heart. For Rollin, letter writing gave him an outlet for the shocks of the war, a means to chronicle events, and a vehicle to form arguments and test theories about the war effort. But they also served to reassure loved ones at home. He was persevering. He was okay. He relished the letters he received from loved ones and insisted family write back to him immediately. The first of his letters brimmed with enthusiasm as Rollins settled into the reality of his decision, and he proudly signed it, Yours for the Union, R.B. Truesdell. As the war progressed, and Rollins' eyes opened to the brutalities of what he saw and was expected to do and endure, Rollin took to closing his letters to his parents, your affectionate son. My great-grandfather, Arthur Truesdell, transcribed Rollins' letters in 1916. The letters and devotion to their preservation passed to my father. In 2001, Dad painstakingly retyped all of the letters to create digital files and added some accompanying detail about some of the key battles in which Rollin and his unit fought. Dad passed some 120 letters that survived onto me. The envelopes depicted on the slide are from some of these letters. The one in the center of the screen is addressed to Clara E. Truesdell. Clara was the sibling closest in age to Rollin, and arguably the sibling closest to Rollin relationship-wise as well. The affection they felt for each other comes shining through in the letters. For example, in the autumn of 1862, despite everything else he was contending with, Rollin was preoccupied with making sure Clara could buy the sewing machine she had her heart set on. He wanted to sell his prized watch to ensure that she had the money for that. Clara never married, and as an adult, she lived with Rollin and his family and undoubtedly helped raise the children. I don't know for sure, but I believe it to be highly likely that Clara kept the collection of Rollins' letters together and then passed them on to my great-grandfather. <coughs> so. okay. Let's turn now to the arc of Rollins' trek through the Civil War. Rollin was in a hurry to enlist after President Lincoln's call on April 15, 1861 for 75,000 volunteers to put down the rebellion. Given Liberty's geographic location, hugging the state line with New York, it was most expedient for Rollin to look northward. We can see on the slide Susquehanna County and just to the north of that Binghamton and to the west of that Elmira. Downstate Pennsylvania lo um, rendezvous locations were at Philadelphia and Harrisburg. Binghamton, with an active citizen committee uh, calling out for patriots of broom, as this recruitment poster booms, drew him like a magnet. Three companies were formed there by the first week of May 1861, including the one that Rollin joined. With excitement, 
Rollin wrote his first letter home as a soldier on May 9th from Binghamton. It reads in part, Dear friends, I am feeling quite easy having just enrolled my name in the C Company and took the oath of allegiance to the stars and stripes amid the cheers and hurrahs of the company and bystanders. Yours for the Union, R.B. Truesdell. From there, the three companies traveled to the Elmira Military Depot, where they joined with other companies from New York to become the 27th New York Volunteers. <coughs> with companies G and H hailing from Livingston County and K from Orleans, it is, I believe it's entirely possible that young men from this area traveled to these recruitment sites and became comrades with Rollin in the 27th New York Volunteers. West Point graduate Henry Slocum became their colonel, and Binghamton native J.J. Bartlett their major. Each rose to the rank of major general by the end of the war, and Rollins spoke unwaveringly highly of them in his letters, in contrast to some other military and political leaders under whose command he fell. As one of the earliest regiments to form in New York, the 27th fell under the, the auspices of the New York state law calling for a two-year commitment rather than the three years uh, called for by the War Department. Rollins' regiment was indeed in the thick of the war, fighting in the Eastern Theater from the first Battle of Bull Run on July 21, 1861, through the Chancellorsville campaign in the beginning of May, 1863. During that first devastating clash of eager green soldiers at Bull Run, Rollin was held back to help man regimental headquarters. He contracted mumps, a disease that swept through the army camps and targeted many from rural areas who had not had contact with the disease. Rollin was lucky to avoid typhoid, smallpox, malaria, and other diseases that tormented so many soldiers throughout the war. When the battlefield reports came in from Bull Run, Rollin was stunned as was most of the North. The unspeakable had happened. Instead of returning to Washington as triumphant victors, Rollins' comrades would limp back, bloodied and defeated. The 27th New York Volunteers suffered their, single most, their most significant single day of loss on July 21st, 1861, and 60 men were taken prisoner. Indeed, the carnage at Bull Run rattled the very foundation of the Union Army. On July 26, Rollin wrote a letter to his sister with updated information about the loss, and it reads in part, Dear Sister Clara, the report I received from the battlefield was that Captain Jay was killed, and afterward that he was taken prisoner, but he made his escape and came into camp late Monday night. Lieutenant Asa Park was instantly killed and his body left on the battlefield. I suppose that many of our dead are lying on the field unburied. Tis awful, but true. The period after Bull Run was a time of reckoning and realignment within the Union Army. President Lincoln reached into what was Western Virginia for a general who had a veneer of success from a series of battles, which were more like skirmishes, to take over command of what would become the Army of the Potomac. Major General George B. McClellan came eastward and devoted himself to the twin tasks of fortifying Washington and building an army in his vision. It is during the autumn of 1861 when the focus of this army's efforts was trench digging and fort building that Rollins Regiment, the 27th New York Volunteers, was transferred to the brigade that would remain within throughout the duration of their commitment. The brigade was first led by Henry Slocum, the, the 27th First Colonel. When Slocum was promoted to division command, J.J. Bartlett was elevated to brigade command and continued in that position throughout the 27th enlistment period. Towards the beginning of the Peninsula Campaign in the spring of 1862, President Lincoln agreed to expand the number of corps. Slocum's division with Bartlett's brigade became part of the 6th Corps. 
the Peninsula Campaign was leader of the Army of the Potomac, George McClellan's gambit to grab Richmond from the east. Key locations where battles were fought or the Union Army established camps for an extended duration are underlined in blue on the map on the screen. Rollin first shot a Confederate soldier in the early days of the Peninsula Campaign. As the Confederate Army continued to draw itself closer to Richmond, the Union Army followed it, and Rollin rode home as he could. On May 17th, a day after his regiment marched from the massive Army of the Potomac campground uh, depicted on the screen at Cumberland Landing, Rollin penned a letter to his sister, including this line. My dear sister, we are daily marching onward toward the Confederate capital, and only 20 miles intervene between us and the legislative halls of traitors. The series of battles known as the Seven Days Battles began on June 25, 1862, and over the course of a week, Confederate General Robert E. Lee and his army pushed the numerically superior Army of the Potomac from Richmond's doorstep and shoved it into a crouching position along the James River at Harrison's Landing. Of these battles, Gaines Mill likely left the most indelible mark on Rollin. With reinforcements withheld, he and his comrades fought, and I think it's justified to say heroically, against overwhelming odds. After the Seven Days Battles, Rollin wrote an extensive, detail-rich letter to his father of this experience. I believe this letter fully exposes the heartache of war and the character of Rollin. I'd like to share the portion of the letter in which Rollin describes his escape after the Battle of Gaines Mill. Rollin wrote, In camp, 2 o'clock p.m., the sun is pouring down upon us with all its fury, but I will endeavor to finish my letter and get it off in today's mail, which leaves at 6 o'clock this evening. When we left the battlefield just in the edge of the evening, we left many of our dead and wounded behind us, expecting to be able to go back with ambulances and fetch them away, but quite a number fell into the hands of the enemy the next day. When I was leaving the field, I stepped over the body of a wounded soldier whom I recognized as John Merritt, whose widowed mother I think lives at Susquehanna Depot. He was wounded through the thigh. I lifted him up and tried hard to carry him off the field, but he was so exhausted from the loss of blood, he could not help himself at all. And after carrying him a short distance, I was compelled to lay him down. As he was prisoner of war, prisoner all of last summer after the Battle of Bull Run, I thought it more than a double portion for the poor fellow if, it, uh, if left behind. Afterwards, I could not find him, and whether he fell into the hands of the enemy or not, I cannot say. A half mile to the rear of the battlefield, our brigade halt halted until half past 11 p.m., then received orders to cross the river at our, to our camp. At the time this order was given, I was enjoying a sound sleep neath a cluster of trees, and not being awakened, was left undisturbed till morning. At daylight, I started for camp, and one of General Slocum's aides rode by and told us to hurry over the bridge, for it would soon be cut away. I started on at a quick pace, but had proceeded but a little ways when I overtook a poor fellow, wounded in the leg, who belonged to the 14th Regulars. It being only half a mile to the bridge, and the fellow only weighing about 130 pounds, I concluded to try and back him over, or carry him the way children call puce back. Though it was a hard job, his thanks as I placed him safely in the ambulance thrice paid me for the effort. With rebel soldiers breathing down his neck, and the sole remaining bridge available to cross the, the Chickahominy River about to be destroyed, Rollin trotted for a half mile with a wounded man on his back to ensure both could reach safety. Robert E. Lee brought the war north in September of 1862, and finally Rollin was able to write to his father of a conclusive victory he was a part of, 
Crampton's Gap at South Mountain. In Rollins' words, thank God we whipped him, even if it was a Sunday. The map on the left of the screen shows the South Mountain Ridge and Crampton's Gap. The dashes of blue show Slocum's division. The 27th in New York was assigned to lead the attack that day. The 121st New York, not yet led by Colonel Emery Upton, had joined Bartlett's brigade on the march to South Mountain and was held in reserve that day. From South Mountain, Rowland and his comrades joined the battle at Antietam. However, McClellan opted not to have Slocum's division launch a counterattack to re relieve pressure on badly hemorrhaging units who had been fighting since early that morning. Instead, Rowland and his battle-ready comrades were ordered to hold in place for 40 hours on the skirts of the cornfield where some of the heaviest fighting occurred artillery and infantry fire at times enveloping them like a wet wool blanket. In a letter to his sister Clara, dated October 6th, Rollin tried to express the shocking scene of death in relatable terms. The dead rebels lay so thick around us that we could not stir without stumbling over them. I counted 65 on a piece of ground no larger than our garden up at the farm. The photo on the right of the screen shows the view that Rollin may have seen from his position on the field near the East Woods. September 17, 1862 is the single bloodiest day in U.S. history, with, 20, with a combined loss of 22,700 men killed or wounded. In the pre-dawn hours of September 19th, General Lee and his Confederate forces recrossed the Potomac and return to the South, unfettered by Union pursuit. Rollin endured Ambrose Burnside's, Ambrose Burnside's tenure as commander of the Army of the Potomac and so experienced the Battle of Fredericksburg, though fortunately was not on the slope of Mary's Heights where the mass slaughter of Union troops occurred. In another letter, to his sister Clara, Rollin described the anticipation of the battle at Fredericksburg and the mental anguish soldiers felt in the wait. Rollin wrote, My dear sister, I never was more loath to go into battle than I was at Fredericksburg, and the long suspense we were in before crossing was almost as bad as actually to be engaged. The work to be done was evident for days before the time arrived. And as far as possible, I was nerved up to the work before us and went into action as coolly as I ever commenced a day's work at home. After crossing, and while resting in a ravine from which we expected to march out in line of battle to meet the enemy, many parting words were spoken between the men of our regiment, all expecting, almost knowing, that we were to meet the foe, and therefore some must fall and never meet their friends again. The conversation between myself and Conrad was short and to the point. Keep close together. If we are driven back, neither shall be left alone. I have that confidence in my friend that I believe if I had been wounded and our forces retreated, he would have stayed with me. Roland also participated in Burnside's earlier mentioned disastrous mud march of January 1863. This aborted assault through freezing temperatures, soaking rain, and of course, smothering mud, became fodder for gleeful rebel ridicule. And ultimately, it was the undoing of Burnside's command of the Army of the Potomac. Men, many men did not survive the fiasco. Others were sickened for a lifetime. <coughs> the final battles in which Rollin fought were during the Chancellorsville campaign, when the Sixth Corps was peeled off from the rest of the Army of the Potomac and left to duke it out with the enemy by themselves. And in fact, it is during these days when Rollin was injured for the first time. A shell exploded near to him and left him badly concussed and deaf in one ear. But he got up and continued fighting with his brethren. I'd like to take just a minute to review some of the contributing factors that led to Rollin's transition from eager recruit to war-weary veteran. 
like so many in the North, Rollin believed that the conflict would be over in one, maybe two battles, that the rebellion would collapse under the weight of the superior Union Army. Instead, the Union Army was dealt blow after blow by the Confederate Army, and particularly after General Robert E. Lee took over command in the East. The gore and bloodshed dragged on. Rollin was frustrated with the civilian leadership in Washington and the governors who he, he felt were meddling in military affairs to benefit themselves politically. As far as commanders, in general, McClellan was beloved by his men from the time of his appointment as commander of the Army of the Potomac, but he often seemed paralyzed and unable to use his vast army to pursue the enemy. Then Burnside. He lacked self-confidence and overcompensated by rigidly adhering to doom strategies that sacrificed many Union soldiers' lives. And finally, Joe Hooker, the general whose bravado crumbled when he was given the reins of the Army of the Potomac. The buck stops with him for the Chancellorsville debacle. In the letter you see on the screen, Rollin wrote the following words to his father on May 6, 1863, after Chancellorsville. We crossed the river yesterday a defeated army, and it is my opinion this is the worst whipping we ever took. All this on the eve of Rollin mustering out and going home. <coughs> Rollin's letters tell the story of his awakening to the costs of war, even as he solidified his conviction that this war and winning it was imperative. Sacrificing this country was not an option. In one of his most memorable letters, Rollin wrote the following to his eldest sister, Julia, on March 26, 1863. Dear Sister Julia, I am anxious to have this terrible drama close and would willingly stand my chances for life or death in another seven days fight, another Antietam, South Mountain, and Fredericksburg, if I could feel sure that by another New Year's Day we could conquer and dictate terms of peace which would be lasting and ensure prosperity and happiness to the nation for a term of years beyond which there can be no possibility of the present incumbents of the earth seeing. My great-great-grandfather, Rollin B. Truesdell, mustered out of U.S. service on June 5, 1863, in Elmira, New York. The 1885 book on Broome County military history described the return of the 27th New York Volunteers, and I'd like to share an excerpt. The language has a beautiful flourish to it, and um, Binghamton, by the way, is the county seat for Broome County. People poured in from all parts of the county. Artillery salutes were fired as the train moved in, bringing in from the front what was left of Broome's first offering to the nation. As the veterans marched through the streets in their uniforms, gray with the dust of their memorable service, thousands cheered, and the air was filled with bouquets tossed from the packed sidewalks. I can just see it in my mind. <laughs> The photo on the screen is of the 27th New York's regimental flag at the conclusion of their service. As you can see, it was struck many times by enemy shot and fragments of shell, leaving gaping holes. What you may not notice immediately is that there was a hole exactly where one of the stars should be. It was during the final days of battle when a star was literally shot out of the flag. The quick-thinking uh, color bearer scooped it up to ensure it would be part of the 27th legacy. The star was attached to the staff before the flag was deposited with the Bureau of Military Records in Albany. After the war, Rollin opted to move to Binghamton and began his post-war career as a carpenter. Over the years, Rollin took on various business enterprises, including ownership of a grocery store. Rollin was civic-minded, and he is credited with leading efforts to settle uh, the previously undeveloped southern part of Binghamton. 
and he was a popular speaker at schools and elsewhere about his experiences during the Civil War. Rollin remained connected with his army comrades through membership in the Bartlett Post of the Grand Army of the Republic, the GAR. And he assumed officer positions in the 27th New York Volunteer Survivors Association, including as its president. And despite what he wrote to his sister Julia during the war about the desirability of bachelorhood, Rollin married pretty darn quickly after he mustered out of service. My great-grandfather, Arthur, was born to his second wife, Trifana. One of Rollin's obituaries was titled Final Bugle Call, The Death of a Prominent War Veteran. Another referred to him as a Christian gentleman with a strong influence for good. A street in Binghamton is named for Rollin. And now on to my discovery. Not in my wildest dreams would I have thought this possible, but there it was in a book by Don Troiani on Civil War uniforms. There was Rollins' uniform. Troiani, you probably know, is a famous uh, military history artist known in particular for depicting scenes from the Civil War. So after um, some research, I found his email address and sent him a note explaining who I was um, and the research I was doing around Rollin. And I asked if I could please, please come to his studio to see Rollin's uniform. He wrote back within 15 minutes, um, but unfortunately he said that he no longer um, had Rollin's uniform. He had sold it as part of his collection to the US Army and believed it would be in the possession of the National Museum of the U.S. Army at Fort Belvoir, a museum that at that point had yet to open. And so my sleuthing turned to the museum. Um, I finally was able to connect with the curator there. Um, kudos to cur curators. <laughs> Um, and despite the fact that he was incredibly busy preparing for the opening of the museum, and it was smack in the middle of the pandemic, October of 2020, the curator organized for me to visit their vast warehouse um, so that I could spend some time with Rollins' uniform. I will never forget the experience. Um, it, it was um, just hard to express how it felt standing next to the clothes that my great-great-grandfather had worn 157 years earlier while he was fighting for the life of this country as well as his own life. I couldn't help but notice the hand-stitched stripes um, denoting the rank of sergeant. There was his haversack that he had stuffed with cake and ham and boiled eggs as he was preparing to return to his regiment after recruitment duty. I knew that this would be the closest to being in the presence of Rollin that I would ever, ever be. Mm -hmm. In closing, I just would like to share with you that immersing myself in Rollin's experiences in the Civil War and learning more about my family history along the way has felt like the privilege of a lifetime. It's as if I found a part of myself that I didn't even know was missing. I probably don't need to say this to you, but I will. If you have your own packet of letters, your own treasures, I really encourage you to follow through with your own history projects. Learning more about your family is truly a powerful thing. Thank you. If anyone has any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. Yes. I'd just like to make a comment it was very interesting. The, the lecture was very interesting, but when you showed that flag of the 27th New York Infantry, did you, you probably did, but when you made the comment about, hey look, they took one of the stars over the target, did you know that that big torn was, it looked like a lady of the times back then. <clears throat> you see that? 
Do you see what I'm seeing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I do see a silhouette. She is. Yeah. 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 And I'm not sure which newspaper that this photo came from. I don't recall. But well, doesn't that look as you're just me? Say, say that again. It looks like. It looks like a silhouette of a lady. In, in like 18. Yes, it does. yes, yeah. it does. Yeah. It does. With the hat, and it looks like a little ribbon on the top. With a bonnet. Yeah. Yeah. A little yeah. bit of Staring a face in her body. Star, right? yeah. 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 Yep. And yeah. I will I will share with you that um, I, for quite a while, was determined that I was going to find the flag. I really, really wanted to, to be able to, to lay my eyes on that in person too, and made numerous uh, phone calls. Um, the museum in Saratoga, um, Albany, I talked to, and I, I'm not sure that it, I'm not sure where it is. I, I hope to goodness that it continues to exist. Yes, my first question is a wonderful presentation. Thank you. What do you do you most want to do in your life? I, um, um, I recently um, uh, I recently was with the US Department of State and I spent a uh, number of years working in Central and East Africa. I was with the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations. Yeah. You just saw you talking and you had me. I was fascinated to teach you why you just present yourself. Well, thank you very much. That means a lot to me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I spent, I, was, I think I mentioned earlier, um, I came by way of Maine. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was in uh, living in Maine, I was also a docent at the Joshua Chamberlain Museum. Oh, in Brunswick. Yeah. Yeah, um, okay. And so, so that name rings a bell? <laughs> <laughs> and that was, that was an absolute honor to, to work there. Um, yeah. I truly enjoyed it. Yes? When uh, the regiment uh, was mustered out, where did the, uh, any other, I should put it this way, did any of the other soldiers go into another unit? Who yes. Who wanted to extend their Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Thank you for asking about that. Um, so as I mentioned um, midway, perhaps, uh, 27th uh, two-year regiment and one of the earliest ones who um, enlisted or who signed up. So a number of the men did re-enlist, um, including Rollins' tent mate, William Westerbelt. Um, his tent mate um, actually wrote a book which was um, very helpful to me in writing my book mm -hmm. um, because Westervelt um, was not only uh, charismatic but a great observer. Westervelt did re-enlist, Rollins Tenday did re-enlist after spending I think the summer back at home. Um, I think it was dif a difficult decision for many because while of course they were pined for home and loved ones and the safety it was also difficult, I think, for some to be a bystander again. Mm -hmm. And frankly, there was also some critique about the, um, the fighting might, let's say, of those who were maybe not as willingly engaged, not as willingly a participant in the war. That is, um, the longer that time went on and the drafts came on and, and so on and so forth, could they be trusted to really fight in the same way? Did they know as much? No, of course they didn't know as much. And so um, Roland did not. He, um, again, had the, that concussion and um, I don't know how long that took for him to, to be right by it. I do know um, that he, had it um, disability payments later on, and he complained of rheumatism. Mm -hmm. To me, it's just amazing what they lived through the yeah. conditions, and that there wasn't more illness. Mm -hmm. um, as I said earlier, um, 
there were times when Rollin would write about the smallpox um, um, uh, epidemics all around them. And we had to buy another coffin for um, a comrade who died of typhoid. So Rollin did pretty well to get through it. Um, and it's amazing to think about those who then re-opt, mm -hmm. knowing what they knew. Was he at Salem Church? Yes. They, he fought alongside uh, Emory Upton. Actually, that's in my book. Yeah. <laughs> Upton um, features uh, quite prominently. First he led, yeah. Bible. Yeah, it's yeah. when reading that whole um, that whole, about that battle, which isn't described in a lot of other books, but Upton's bravery is just. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and he, uh, his brother Henry, uh, Upton's uh, brother Henry, uh, was uh, wounded and captured, uh, and uh, he did uh, get him back uh, finally, but he never served any longer. But it, it was really the first major engagement for the 121st right. New York, right. Right. Bartlett. Yeah. Right. Right. And um, I talk about the the Bartlett and Upton going together to the front. And yes. Yeah, it's um, the 121st is lucky that Upton became the colonel. Mm -hmm. Very much, yeah. yeah. Yes. How many letters were there? Well, um, so I have uh, about 120. There's about 103 in the book. It's impossible to know what others um, went elsewhere. It's just impossible to know. Um, I just am astounded, frankly, to have the handwritten ones that I do have, and they're in very good condition, too. Um, with, I, I don't, I think you might have been here when I mentioned that my grandfather is one of ten children. So, I feel especially privileged to have the letters given the breadth of the Truesdale clan. Um, so I, it's possible that others are out there, but I have not had any um, any word of that. And have you thought about what you will do with them? I yes, I have. Um, there, I have them um, ar archivally protected now, but they really need to to be with Rollins uniform. Um, and so I. Um, have it, it's been kind of a crazy year. Um, so the curator and I had exchanged um, emails, um, and I knew that he was close to retirement. So I need to, to reconnect on that and, and make sure that that, ha that happens because that, to me, is the best place for for them to, to be. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So how did they know that that was wrong with the uniform? Who were they? Was their name, was it embroidered, or how did the you know, actor? There, what, there was, um, his name was in the uniform. Was that for everyone, or is that something that the soldiers themselves put in, or how did the... I think it depended on the soldier. Um, I also, there's there's always another story. <laughs> so when I was in Binghamton, when I first um, launched the book, um, I uh, did a small tour in the Binghamton, Susquehanna County area. And a gentleman at that talk in Binghamton came up before, right before I was getting ready to speak and said, you're going to be really angry with me. And I, I was like, oh, and then I had to go and speak. And so, okay, like, do you know what car I'm driving? Like, did you blah, 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 why? So he afterwards told me that he, for a time, had Rollins uniform in his possession. And so, We've been in touch, of course, since then, and then he directed me to the intermediate step, I think, between Troiani and himself. There were maybe two or three, but how the gentleman in Binghamton, there's a missing step. Mm. Um, I know that the uniform was handed over in a box from Newell and Truesdell, which was a huge grocery store concern that Rollins son um, he was very successful in Binghamton. So it was in his um, packaging from his son's shop. So I think his, his Rollins' grandson, I'm sorry to say, 
probably like sold it or <coughs> I just kind of wondered if, if when they got their uniform if they had their name in it or if they, they put it in or what was the custom of the time to for the soldiers to like it's not like they because they did have laundry uniforms, uniforms you know. so um, they used to pin their name in their uniform in case they were wounded or killed and that way they'd be identified yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I was in the uh, army and they said, basic training, they said, you've got to put your name in your boots. And uh, said, why do we have to do that? <laughs> they said, no. <laughs> if you get thrown with smithereens, at least, you know, we'll have something, a, a means of identifying you if, right. if your dog tags have flown. And, right. It is hard when in um, uh, South Mountain at Crampton's Gap, they spent two days burying the dead. And, um, and at Antietam, there's some more discussion in the book that Roland talks about um, where some of the soldiers didn't have identification. And um, how sad is that mm -hmm. you know, to be digging these trenches and there's no record. But um, luckily, I want to swing this back up onto a nice note. <laughs> Roland's uniform was in great condition. Um, of course, it was you know, later from the, um, he mustered out wearing it. Um, but it was just an amazing thing to see. And uh, I mentioned early on, he was six foot one inches tall. And my dad was a big guy, too. And I just thought, wow, he, I, he, was, he was a big man. And it really showed in the mm -hmm. uniform. It was really quite something to see. So, amazing that it was as a jack. You know? It really is. It really is. I had, I felt like I kept on having these pieces of good luck, finding the uniform, um, Rollins' tent mate's book, which I highly <coughs> recommend, um, Lights and Shadows of the Army Life by William Westerveld. Wow. Uh, Lights, Lights and Shadows of Army Life by William Westerveld. And the regiment um, had regimental history, and um, the author, or the key um, editor, was a good friend of Rollins. So there was just a, I just felt very lucky to have had such interesting additional sources. And then going to Susquehanna County and to Binghamton, there were Truesdale family folders. So there's the, that sort of historical information available. Well. As well, obviously you had to do a lot of hard digging to find it. So they did just come I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was, it was, it was a, it was definitely, a, yeah, a joy. Yeah. Who was the salary of a sergeant during that I don't know. You know, Roland would talk in a couple of letters. Um, one time, he, from two or three months worth of um, of uh, pay was fifty six dollars to send back. But he also was a company clerk for a time, and um, You're talking for a month. No, I think I think it must have been a couple of months. I don't know for sure. I don't I don't want to say something erroneous. When would you spend your money on if you were in the war? Food. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. Imagine yeah. Roland bought a pair of boots. I know for eight dollars because uh, a pair that he had sent from home were too small. So he uh, sold them for six dollars and bought a pair for eight dollars. <laughs> yeah. Some interesting um, parts in there about using Confederate uh, contraband money too, <laughs> which I really appreciate. <laughs> but I, I really want to thank you. I think um, Ryan, unless there's anything else that what was the span of time that you wrote the book? I started in earnest. It, this has been going on in the back of my mind for a long, long time. And when I left the State Department, I knew I wanted to do some writing. And I was keen to pick this up to be able to collaborate with my dad, who I was very close to. And um, so I began in well, I'm going to say the fall of 2019, and then 
um, SUNY Press, it, um, it was published in December of 2022. So I was on a mission to work as fast as I could to work with dad. I would write a chapter, send it to him, and then he would send back uh, for his eagle eyes review. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next Wednesday is our next guest speaker. Uh, we're continuing the theme with the Civil War. We have Chris Mikowski coming uh, to talk about Grant's last battle. Uh, so we don't want to miss that one. He's another wonderful speaker. If you've come to the previous ones here, you'll, you'll know that. And then we have another guest speaker on Tuesday, November 7th, uh, Stephen Huff, uh, who just wrote a book called uh, Resting Among Us. It's about the uh, author's grave sites of New York State um, and even our own John Gardner has got a significant part in the book so he's familiar with our area uh, we've also got a trivia coming up on the 12th at GoArt on the Cuban Missile Crisis and then what we've all, I know we've all been waiting for November 17th is the kickoff of Wonderland Trees so we're going to shift real quickly into uh, the Christmas season, so I hope you're all ready. Uh, we've got already a bunch of trees ready to be decorated, so it is going to be a, a wonderful time. So hope to see you all then, and hope to see you at all our other events. So, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. 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 I'm not related to